Charles Bernstein is Donald T. Regan, Professor of English and Comparative Literature at the University of Pennsylvania. He is the author of over 40 books, most recently All the Whiskey in Heaven, Selected Poems, 2010, from Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux, and Attack of the Difficult Poems, Essays and Inventions, University of Chicago Press, 2010. In 2006, Bernstein was elected a Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Says Bernstein, I am professor of poetry. I take the term literally. I profess poetry in a society and often a classroom where poetry is at best a half forgotten thing, something confined to the peripheries of cultural imagination, a once grand enterprise perhaps, but today eclipsed by more compelling media. Ian Probstein, professor of English at Turo College here in New York, is Russian-American poet and translator of poetry in both directions, the author of more than a dozen books and anthologies, including essays on T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, William Butler Yeats. He has just published the translation of Charles Bernstein's War Stories in Foreign Literature, one of the oldest and most prestigious Russian magazines. In 2003, he published a bilingual edition of Ezra Pound with his introduction and notes, which was the best translation book of the year in Russia. Gentlemen, welcome to Breaking Through. Poets once deserved to be considered as seers and prophets. Do they still? I, I would believe that they are, as Shelley said, that they are legislators of the world. Um, Emerson said that poets are seers and seers. Um, but first of all, in this society, poets are, uh, deserve to be heard in, in the first hand. Uh, a famous Shelley uh, quote that you mentioned, uh, poets are the legislatures of the world. Oppen, George Wonderful, American poet George Oppen said the poets are the legislatures of the unacknowledged uh, world. And then, of course, uh, Rosemary Waltrop, not of course, but Rosemary Waltrop, a wonderful contemporary poet, added to that that she didn't want to be a legislator at all. So there was a problem with the whole met metaphor. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have such an exalted view. I think poetry is an art form, and they're not better or worse than any other art form, the screenwriting or uh, uh, pop songwriting or... Uh, How about uh, rapping? Well, rapping is a kind of a kind of poetry, but certainly any whatever painting or uh, uh, or any other art art form. So uh, it really depends on the poem and so on. I don't think poets are prophetic or not prophetic. I think mm -hmm. it's a it's a range of different mm -hmm. possibilities. I think a lot of people, a lot of things that people associate historically with poetry. Um, uh, are taken up by people who work in other media, especially in popular music. So I think what happens with poetry is that it changes over time and it radically transformed in our time from what it needed to be and what it was you know, in the historical past. Mm -hmm. So my answer is no. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe it's a good time to ask you this question. Now, why do you work in poems, both of you? Um, I work in poems because I uh, can't do very much else. It's one of these things where I uh, am able to uh, kind of move words around and create sounds and so on, and uh, I'm not so good at anything else. So I do it really, if I could do something else, um, I'm, I'm sure I would. Mm -hmm. What would you do uh, if you could do something else? Uh, well, if I could, for example, uh, uh, write music or operas, perhaps I'd do that. I'd work with the wonderful uh, composers. Uh, perhaps if I could run fast, I could uh, have been a, a racer and so on. Okay, but I, I, two, uh, two options there. Uh, painting. Yeah. Oh, what about well, you, Ian? I, I believe that uh, poetry is multi-dimensional, unlike any other media which is at best 3D. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing. The other thing is, uh, to quote uh, ABC of reading, poetry is the mo most condensed form of mm -hmm. expression. I would say that uh, it's time and space condensed in images. Mm -hmm. So the so, economy adds to its power? Um, well, it's not exactly economy. It's a um, uh, poly semantic word. Word has many meanings, uh, and uh, that's um, a kind of another view at the world, perception of the world, if you, if you. Mm -hmm. So it, it changes our perception at, at any given meaning because uh, m there is no um, uh, static meaning. 
Mm-hmm. You cannot establish. Meaning is mm-hmm. changing. Mm-hmm. Meaning mm-hmm. is as as long as is it has uh, united with uh, sound. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why. Uh, well, I, I coined that to uh, describe the poetry both of um, the Russian futurist Klebnikov and the great Russian poet uh, Osip Mandelstam. They have sound meaning blended together. In Russian, there is one uh, compound word. For that sound meaning, zvuka mm. smysl. Mm-hmm. Good time to talk about meaning, meaning in in poetry, subjective, objective. Should it mean or something? Does it have to mean something? Tells. Is it a mistake if it means something? Um, well, it, as I said, it means at every given uh, point in a definite context. It has no fixed meaning. It, it should be uh, expressed and interpreted as together with the reader uh, and every generation uh, it, it's, it's me- meanings shift. Would you and and the, the, the best thing in any art and in poetry in particular is this shift and meaning shift of convention. It's uh, um, what, by the way, uh, so that's how uh, language poetry started with Austronenia defamiliarization, shift, constant shift of meaning. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. what is conventional mm-hmm. um, sh- should be um, as at, at one uh, or the other point overcome. Mm-hmm. It's a different type, in my view, I don't know how Charles agreed with that uh, anxiety of influence. It's a completely different thing. It's not just a psychological or Freudian thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's it's um, um, what, what, what Emerson once said. You 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 take this fossil language and make it alive. Mm-hmm. That's why how you overcome uh, static meaning. Mm-hmm. And that's what poetry can do. Yes. Would yeah. you say that poetry? We have you have to hear from you on this, Pushes. Charles. But would you say that poetry? is more able to do that, this kind of flexibility of meaning or interpretation, it, much more so? And Because I know that you teach literature. It, and do you allow the same flexibility for interpretation of, say, a short story or a novel as you might in poetry? Well, uh, if we take James Joyce, uh, that's uh, poetry and prose, or prose and poetry. And, and that's, uh, and by the way, yesterday was, uh, mm, of course, Bloom's Day, mm-hmm. uh, 16th of June, ni- uh, 1904 is uh, where Ulysses was. The reference. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, Of course, um, um, there is poetry and prose and prose and poetry. Sure. Uh, What what I I think that uh, it's a constant discovery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and that's what I encourage um, my students as well. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to talk a bit about your, your relationship um, as uh, the translator of Charles' poetry. Uh, Ian, how, how can you expect to capture the essential meaning of the poet that you're translating? And I thought this might be a good opportunity to have something to read, I think, in both languages, yes? We might actually look well, at the nuances, uh, differences between the two. Well, the, Talk a bit about that. Ian, it talks a little bit about the uh, significance of the Russian futurists. He mentions um, Viktor Shlavsky's uh, term Austrani, which would mean estrangement or taking things out of their familiar context and using them in, a, in an odd uh, way. And, uh, you know, it might be better in terms of your question about m- meaning to think about what poems do than what they mean, how, mm-hmm. they, how they work mm-hmm. rather than uh, how you would translate them mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Into, or paraphrase them. Mm-hmm. So one of the great models uh, which we're celebrating now, the centennial of, just as we uh, have this. Uh, Hundred year uh, mark for uh, Velomir Klebnikov. Klebnikov uh, was the inventor of something called Zaum, which is a trans sense. Sense, or right, trans sense would be the, the I think the best way to translate Zaum. Um, so it's beyond sense, but really it's like an abracadabra language. It's a made up language or a Jabberwocky uh, language, to use the reference to Lewis Carroll that, that people tend to know. So it's all the whole poem is in made up language. So. We thought uh, we would read a, 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 the Russian and then my translation of the mm-hmm. English of this great uh, poem on its 100th anniversary, Incantation by Laughter in English. Sounds great. Заклятие смехом. 
О, рассмейтесь, смехачи! О, засмейтесь, смехачи! Что смеются смехами, что смеянствует смеяльно! О, засмейтесь, усмеяльно! О, рассмешишь над смеяльных смех усмейных смехачей! О, и смейся, рассмеяльно, смех над смейных смехачей! Смеева, смеева! Усмей, осмей, смешики, смешики, смеюнчики, смеюнчики. О, рассмейтесь, смехачи. О, засмейтесь, смехачи. So here's my, my translation of this poem. Incantation by laughter. We laugh with our laughter. Lok laffer and loafer, sloaf laffer and leffer, lop laughter and loofer, loop slapper and lassler, pleat loper ek lippler, bloop oofer and ooter, floop flaffer ep fluber, fult lickless and slickler, ak lushing, ag laughing, ook loofing, ip loopling, ook lippening, ga sprickling, ook laughter, ook laughing, ook laughing, ook laughter. This is sound meaning. Mm -hmm. So for us, really, the poems work as much by, by sound and not necessarily by sound understood as, as uh, representing something or saying something. Mm -hmm. The sound itself uh, is liberated in some way from traditional senses of sense and meaning in Klebnikov. And, uh, but in general, uh, with much poetry, the rhythm and the sound um, is where the activity of the poem, where the poetic mm -hmm. uh, feeling lies. Mm -hmm. And so to be focusing too much on extracting a meaning from it can go against the ways in which the poems uh, work. So you look, most pleasurable. I understand. And you're looking to evoke an experience in the listener, are you not? And that's where that kind of the, the combination, the experience, the experience, not mm -hmm. simply the meaning, but it's also the sound and the meaning. Somehow yeah. they combine, they make well, something greater than the greater than their sum. Evoke is, Fair to is, say? Is there great, should be integrity, yes. Mm -hmm. e evoke is a great word for that because uh, in the, the root of evoke come, it's, is, is vocate from voice, so it's like bring voice out, so it kind of liberates the voice from sometimes its information function uh, and allows it to do something else. The poetry is not, uh, some poetry, the poetry I'm particularly interested in, is not primarily about its information function, mm -hmm. which uh, has a very important part of language, mm -hmm. law, directions, the news. Poetry is not about that information function. We have lots of opportunities to use verbal language uh, and make it to give information and use it to convey information. Poetry, in a way, is free from that information function, at least the kind of poetry I'm interested in over the past 100 years. And so Shlovsky, uh, Klebnikov, uh, Mayakovsky, uh, uh, Mandelstam or great, uh, you know, heroes uh, for us in the 20th century, the great modernist heroes, along with Gertrude Stein in English and Joyce in mm -hmm. English. It's time to live my bliss. This is going to be an incredible, incredible episode. Yes! Yeah. I say that for you to say, what is your dream? And when are you going to start taking action on it? You can do the same thing. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you all so, so much for coming today. I'm so honored you could be there. This is so exciting. My first show. Thank you for tuning in. And I hope to see you next time. I absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, sure, I can read a few uh, passages from Attack of the Difficult Poems, which is my new book that's just been published uh, from the University of Chicago Press. And uh, the first answers the question often uh, raised to me and having to do with the title of the book about the difficult poem and you know how I got interested in the difficult poem. Mm -hmm. You may be, be, you may, you may, you may, you may be asking yourself, how did I get interested in this topic? of the difficult poem. Let me be frank about my situation. I am the author of and frequent reader of difficult poems. Because of this, 
I have a strong desire to help other readers and authors with hard to read poems by sharing my experience of over 30 years working with difficult poems I think I can save you both time and heartache. I may even be able to convince you that some of the most difficult poems you encounter can provide very enriching aesthetic experiences if you understand how to approach them. But first we must address the question, are you reading a difficult poem? How can you tell? Here is a handy checklist of five questions that can help you answer this question. One, do you find the poem hard to appreciate? Two, do you find the poem's vocabulary and syntax hard to understand? Three, are you often struggling with the poem? Four, does the poem make you feel inadequate or stupid as a reader? And five, is your imagination being affected by the poem? If you answered any of these questions in the affirmative, you are probably dealing with a difficult poem. But if you are still unsure, look for the presence of any of these symptoms, high syntactic, grammatic, or intellectual activity level, elevated linguistic intensity, textual irregularities, initial withdrawal, poem not immediately available, poor adaptability, poem unsuitable for use in love letters, memorial commemorations, etc., and perhaps even on talk television shows, sensory overload or negative mood. Many readers, when they first encounter a difficult poem, say to themselves, why me? The first reaction they often have is to think that this is an unusual problem that other readers have not faced. So the first step in dealing with the difficult poem is to recognize that this is a common problem that many other readers confront on a daily basis. Mm. You are not alone. Mm -hmm. So Bill, I hope that helps you with you know, some of the issues that you're struggling with. So many people <laughs> find poetry inaccessible and difficult. And my idea is, you know, let's reach out in a self-help way and let's, let's, let's try to make a connection between the, 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 the reader and the poem. I really liked your reading of this because there was a certain measure of sarcasm in it. Sarcasm? Me? <laughs> I, we just met. I have no idea, but I think it's fair. Well, no, I think sarcasm uh, to, 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 to make a point. And actually, I really resonated with the idea about feeling stupid because I was afraid. See, here's one of my fears about today is that you guys are going to read some of these poems and I'm going to actually say, well, wh what just happened? Or I'll have to find something to say uh -huh. intelligent or meaningful mm -hmm. and I won't be able to. Or I'll think maybe uh -huh. it's, could it ever be the poem? Is mm -hmm. it, I mean, you never talk about bad poems uh -huh. in that introduction. Well, I, I, is there such a thing I, as a I, bad poem? I, I, I do talk about it in, uh, in in another essay that I that I have in here that was um, uh, call, it, it's called "Against National Poetry Month as Such," and it's also a satiric view about uh, putting forward poetry as if it's supposed to be something good for you, like uh, bran flakes or like uh, a, 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 a wholesome. Uh, which to me is a way of turning uh, people off to poetry what a turn because off, yeah. uh, they, they listen to popular music or television mm -hmm. or, or movies and those are all complex, difficult, emotionally, often mm -hmm. violent, mm -hmm. disturbing, and then mm -hmm. poetry is supposed to be this kind of uh, uplifting, mm -hmm. affirmative thing and it's, it, it, it's, it's very dull. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I say in that essay, I, I want poetry that's bad mm -hmm. for you, yeah. maybe not this bad, but a lot of what I'm interested in as a poet is bad on, uh, in a conventional uh, away. In fact, let me read a poem that, uh, that Ian, also known as Jan, when he came over here to the United States, mm -hmm. they, uh, just, they, they I thought he was actually on the precipice of reading himself. Of an eye. Uh -huh. Well, he, he wanted me to read this poem, Verity and Postmodernism, which is itself a, a, a uh, initially, I thought, a rather incongruous and amusing title, since you don't associate Verity, the great uh, 19th century uh, uh, dramatic opera composer with with postmodernism, and uh, this this poem is in a certain way intentionally bad, as you'll hear, and yet it's perhaps so bad that it may not be so bad. And uh, you remarkably translated that into Russian, so I'm reading this at your request. Yeah, you wrote me an email to say Verity and postmodernism. She walks in beauty like the swans that on a summer day do swarm and crawls as deftly as a spoon 
and spills and sprawls and booms. These moments make a monument, then fall upon a broken calm. They fly into more quenchless rages than Louis XIV or Napoleon. If I could make one wish, I might overturn a state, destroy a kite. But with no wishes, still I gripe complaints, a godly given right. So this is doggerel, right? So by a kind of high standard of modernism or even a plain spoken uh, standard of free verse, uh, it, 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 it's bad. But of course, I'm interested in both the, uh, the vernacular, the accent which I add to my local accent, and using that with the sort of uh, mm -hmm. rhymes that have uh, almost like a purple quality to bring out mm -hmm. what, of course, a lot of people think of as, as, mm -hmm. as, as verse and starting with the you know, wonderful reference to Byron, which you may or may not know, as this is one of the things that could be difficult about poetry, whether one understands the elusiveness or the famous lines for me of Byron, and probably for you, but perhaps not for I, a lot of readers, she walks in beauty. I recognize that actually from, from Dead Poets Society, ah, well, when it was quoted right, there, yeah. and by one of the well, kids. One of in the, the, if people would know the yeah. lines of the 19th century, that's one that they might be likely to know, but a lot of my work in terms of references uses references to the television shows mm -hmm. that I grew up with. Sea Hunt, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. Sea Hunt, oh a my gosh. A lot of people, we're typing ourselves. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I think younger people a good show. not know about Sea Hunt or Lloyd Bridges, but may know about Bo Bridges. Yes, they would. They would know about the children of Lloyd. But mm -hmm. these are just things that I grew up with mm -hmm. in, in, in the 50s. Mm -hmm. Gunsmoke, mm -hmm. James Arness, mm -hmm. who just died. So those references mm -hmm. for me are very common, but, mm -hmm. uh, and Byron, but I mix those different kinds of things. So nobody really mm. could know all the different references. You can't. Yeah. There's not an assumption. One of the issues with difficulty is that if you ha imagine the readership to be, a, a, you know, 500 people in England in 1820, all of whom had read uh, a, a canonical body of work, exactly. Greek class and so on, mm -hmm. then people would know the references. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it used to be up until I would say uh, our generation, people could assume references to the King James Bible, mm -hmm. and there were a lot of references to that. But I think even that mm -hmm. is probably not so common, although I would suspect the mm -hmm. Bible still remains. But it's TV shows that really kind well, of that's not, what our but TV shows collective have a consciousness short, has attracted. Have a short shelf life. I mean, mm -hmm. the Beatles probably uh, have have a time that from the '60s to now people would recognize uh, lines from that. Mm -hmm. I think the TV shows tend to. Uh, be generationally fixed. So I don't mm -hmm. know the TV shows that a lot of people watch now and vice versa. So mm -hmm. it, it, I think it's impossible and not desirable to have this universal mm -hmm. assumption that people will recognize things so that the illusion, this is a favorite term of, of many of us, ALL, it's also mm -hmm. is a kind of illusion, mm -hmm. I -L. Mm -hmm. illusion is the reference to uh, other works, mm -hmm. which is inevitable, mm -hmm. or other streets, or other, you know, uh, mm -hmm. um, well, allusion usually refers to literary works, but there are all kinds of references which are not accessible to readers in a culture uh, that we're in, which has so many different uh, uh, memories, histories, languages, especially in New York, which mm -hmm. is such a mixed, uh, mm -hmm. wonderfully syncretic environment. Yeah. So that creates difficulty sure. if you think you're going to understand it. Mm -hmm. Difficulty disappears when you don't think you need to understand it mm -hmm. when you're not trying to decipher mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. but you just experience it mm -hmm. as you might music or walking down the street yeah. you don't necessarily understand everything walking down the street you make me think of actually as a phrase that comes to mind the truth believed however is a lie in other words when we're so firmly mm -hmm. ensconced in the belief that we we mm -hmm. understand something right. then we best believe that we don't really get it at all i want to ask you what sort of thoughts you're having right now free associate um, the thoughts about um, that uh, these allusions, um, well, they should be investigated. I have a privilege of uh, constant um, communication with Charles. That's why uh, this this type of translation, unlike, say, translation words or so Byron or Shelley, mm -hmm. it's a live thing. It's a living person. Uh, if it's you're a living, yeah, it's a living communication. Uh -huh. It's a living process. You know, this, this really is a remarkable Poetry thing. Which and is translation, mm -hmm. not a, as a made thing, but as a process. Mm -hmm. It's really remarkable, actually. When you're talking about Charles writes a poem in English, and Ian translates that poem with the intention of that poem and the imagery and so forth into another language. Uh, how do you do that? Well, it's not easy, of That's course. Kind of, and Charles it's is hard to get your head around that. easy to translate because 
he plays on uh, idioms and and dissociation, I would say, of, of, of idioms. That such, such creation of such words like anti-malady uh, <laughs> and malcontent, which is actually bad content rather than uh, yeah. uh, displeasure or rebellion or whatever it is. And uh, I, I, from my experience mm -hmm. uh, as a poet and translator, I would say that a word as such is intranslatable or untranslatable. Mm -hmm. There is no such a, even a sound, there is no such a vehicle that can carry on from one language to another literally. And that's why I'm against literal translations mm -hmm. as um, opposed, um, well, what many people in this country do. Mm -hmm. They also say that a translator of poetry is good when a translator of poetry is a poet himself or herself. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not the case. When uh, I would say if it's not the case, then why, why not translate essays or prose or something else? Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. po why poetry of all things? Yeah. Makes no sense to me. A, a poet should, should uh, a translator of poetry should be a poet himself or mm -hmm. herself. That's, As you are. That's, yeah. So that's why it no, works. That, that, that's well, what have to be, I in say. A, in a way, you have to be a poet if you're translating poetry because you're writing poetry in the language you're translating into. Yes. Regardless of what you call yourself, yes. you're producing poems primarily in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the language you're writing it as the translator. So you can't really translate from Russian into English a poem without writing an, an English poem. And of course, we agree on this idea that a poem is a, a translation is an imaginative exchange. There's nothing literal about a poem. Even that, you know, a verity in postmodernism. I mean, for one thing, many people listening to this presumably would would hear aspects of just the sound patterning and my and 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 the and the kind of uh, you know uh, my, my accent accentuated for it. How do you, how do you translate that? It's so much a part of the poem. Mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. Tours emphasis. Yes. I mean, that's yeah. not something that exists in uh -huh. Russian. That's so you have to rethink. Do you get those what subtleties? The poem is. Do you get those the, subtleties? Yeah. This is all, uh, this actually what was already published, mm -hmm. but but. Um, um, here, the choice was evident. I picked up the translation of uh, Byron by a prominent translator of the last century, who was Samuel Marshak, and then I played the same way he did. Mm -hmm. I did, made oh, all good. kind yeah. of yeah. distortions and right. dissociation because they... So you they, can actually use the earlier translation into Russian and play off of that, which already exists in Russian in the past, yeah. mm -hmm. of, the, mm -hmm. of the Byron couplet, the two rhyming lines and so on. It, but it's the whole idea of vernacular itself is not the same in, as in, 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 in American English, as in Russian. So you have to rethink what you're doing in the poem by making a new poem in Russian. To me, the interesting thing about translation is that you have to reinvent what it is that you're doing when you're writing it. So the literalness is Re the death of the Replay, yes. Replay, yes, mm -hmm. only play. Mm -hmm. no, nothing, nothing literal, nothing but literal. Uh, Kafka even said that you, you, can, you cannot translate even um, link verbs or pronouns because uh, this, is, this is impossible. Mm -hmm. they, they have different meanings in... in uh, mm -hmm. um, Keith Walter has a, has a funny app for a great translator from the French as to what's the smallest unit that you're translating. Of course, most people would say it could be the syllable of the word or the line, mm -hmm. but he says it's the poem as a whole because you really have to have mm -hmm. a sense of what the poem is mm -hmm. as a whole. It's a unit, works, it's a unit. And then from there, you sort of figure out what you're going to do. Oh. But the concept, in a sense, mm -hmm. of the poem is is key and then the details of the poem are not always understandable another thing is that my poems are not entirely understandable to english speakers um, <laughs> in terms of the references the syntax and so on so mm -hmm. sometimes people think to translate it they make it much more comprehensible and we have the many poems mm -hmm. translated into English, which are much more, they're like expository summaries. But then you send, it, you send it back, don't you? The, well, I'm not talking about, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah I, I've been fortunate that people translate me, but we have poems translated into English from Spanish, Portuguese, mm -hmm. French, which are more uh, uh, comprehensible than the originals. They yes. lose the whole resonance, become uh -huh. sort of silly. They're like paraphrases. Yes. So you want to keep some understanding of the overall incomprehensibility sometimes mm -hmm. of the original. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here for the first inaugural episode of a brand new show called Still Standing with Ray Wagner.
My mom actually has the recipe for diabetes. That's how deadly our food is. It's like, you know what? I don't think I have an eating problem. Well, your car is filled with White Castle wrappers and stuff. Really? I feel like, I feel like a lesbian from like the 80s. Like Let's check it right now. Honestly, I'm just right. hoping not to die alone so my cat doesn't eat my remains. You can't marry a deaf girl, though, man. I don't want blood on my hands. The TV gets so bad, actually, in the future. At one point, we just hand over a camcorder to a bunch of guidos and watch them get hepatitis for 12 episodes. I want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, that's another episode of Still Standing for Ray Widener and Ray Widener. Thank you guys so much. See you thank next you time. Ray. Thank, thank you, Ray. Thank you, Ray. I want to change gears just for a okay. moment here and try something. This is kind of a bit of a, a bit of a, a Rorschach, Rorschach uh, test mm -hmm. on what poet poetry or uh, poets mean. Um, let me read something. The poet gets us into the core of what it means to be a human being. Is that what poets do? Um, not in my uh, opinion. Uh, Feel I free to disagree. It's okay. Yeah, I mean the concept of the human is uh, is very troubling, and it's uh, people often impose their universal conception of what the human is and therefore treat all kinds of people that they don't think are acting that way as, how could I put it, non-human others. Mm. Perhaps this is a view of Jewish particularism versus uh, Christian universalism to take a big story and just put it in a, a, you know, a famous phrase. So I, I worry about the use of the term human mm -hmm. and, and what's meant. There are biological aspects that we have as uh, homo sapiens, of course, mm -hmm. uh, there are ways that we share things with the animal world, which I think is uh, often, and even with the plant world, mm -hmm. that that are, are are that we have in common. So, human to me is 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 more of a problem than a solution to something, mm -hmm. as is concept as our conceptions of universality. But if the term were Homo sapiens, you tend more to agree with this with this well, phrase. Well, I'm interested in the body. So I think people have bodies, but the bodies express themselves and articulate themselves in the world in radically different ways, both mm -hmm. in our own culture and especially when we're talking about different kinds of cultures. So for me, what I'm interested in right now, in the particular way, and I wouldn't make a claim for all poetry, because I don't think poetry does the same thing in, for different poets at the same time, much less other poets in other places mm -hmm. or other times, but I'm interested in, in, in maximizing the particularity and the, and the kind of d denseness and specificity of, of the poetic in the way that a body can be specific mm -hmm. and dense and particular, uh, mm -hmm. the gravity of that, rather than uh, making kind of universal or generalized uh, uh, utterances about mm -hmm. how things are, or what people think or don't think, and so on. So I'm interested in differences mm -hmm. as much as I'm interested in things that are common. Although I would say that it's our differences that we have in common, that people are very different, people have very many different conceptions, and uh, that may be more what we have in common than these kind of generalized ideas such as the human. Mm -hmm. How about the rebellion and ironic mm -hmm. detachment of poetry? Um, I, I, would, I, I would say that poetry is a process. Is um, it what? A process. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's mm -hmm. not a, a, a I, I don't know, it's a constant investigation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to me, I think that any kind of humor or irony destroys the deep sincerity of the universal human voice, and I'm against comedy. I'm against uh, irony, I'm against sarcasm, and, uh, As and why? I think poetry As why? should be entirely obedient to uh, what we have learned from religious figures, the government, and our parents, and that rebellion, again, is a kind of infantile thing that, that poets, especially in the West, they should know better. On. They should know better. <laughs> they should stop being funny, and they should stop rebelling. That's, that's yes, the they should, damn it. Um, I'm sick and tired of it. I, so am I. Oh, listen, how about this one? All one's poems are, in a sense, the same poem. Well, the question would be which sense? Well, in, in a sense, sense. One sense. One sense. The same poem. Well, in other words, the, is there a meta message to all of your poems? All what words, are you trying to say? All other words, words what are you trying to spit it out? One word <laughs> in the beginning was the word. Um, and then uh, all books oh, are, in a sense, was, one book. Right. Well, that's an interesting, and again, Kind of Jewish uh, concept, which I, I actually, you know, have a great affinity for. It's almost kabbalistic in a sense. You have the words of the Torah itself. You constantly rescramble them to elucidate in a midrashic way, different means. And I am sympathetic to that. Uh, um, uh, you know, maybe the body would be a way to think about that. I mean, I have one body that I, from when I was born to to when I die, and so that unifies it. And I have a life experience. I think it is interesting to think about. Um, 
the, the body and the, and, 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 and the writer as being something which the writing comes from or is inscribed on that body, mm. but there's enormous mm -hmm. diversity and change. Mm -hmm. I try to constantly do different things, mm -hmm. and I'm not trying to say the same thing in different ways, but mm -hmm. nonetheless, there is a connection mm -hmm. that each of us have as individual writers, and also I think very importantly in dialogue and collectivity with other poets and with the culture we're in and so on. So it's, uh, it, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's mezzo mezzo in a way. It's, it's both entirely different, each poem and each line, mm -hmm. and at the same time that's what gives the connection. But it's, to me, I, I, I prefer the idea of, of dialogue. There's a conversation between one poem and another, just as there's a conversation between us right now, mm -hmm. and even the people watching, mm -hmm. listening to us. So mm -hmm. that, and conversation is a word very, I take very, uh, very seriously in that sense mm -hmm. with the word verse in it. I'm interested mm -hmm. in conversation, I'm interested in perversion, mm -hmm. uh, uh, both, turning things around. Verse mm -hmm. itself means versus, it means like plowing, turning things around. So mm -hmm. you're constantly turning things around, mm -hmm. of course then you may get some kind of complex, um, uh, recurrence, which mm -hmm. could be understood as rhythm itself. Mm -hmm. You so. use the word perversion. In what sense do you mean it? Well, uh, per perversion. What does also it mean did, literally? What does the word mean well, literally? We know it's used on the front page of the Daily News. Well, per perversion uh, is, 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 is related to verse. Verse is turning around. So per perversion is 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 turning around in a bad in a bad way. Doing uh -huh. something it's like a, a bad flip side. Right. A bad a bad flip. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, well, that's like what I'm saying about b bad poetry and so mm -hmm, on. I, mm -hmm. I do, uh, it kind of comes back to your, of course, your original question about uh, rebellion and even irony. I'm interested in, 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 what was your term, distant irony, ironic distance? I'm interested in ironic closeness or ironic affectiveness. Ironic me, detachment. Yeah, I'm interested in, in ironic attachment. Yeah. Uh, that's sort of the difference between Especially my in this world. Not, in this world, we need more, more attachment, right. less my, detachment, my right? My humor and irony isn't, isn't an attempt to distance myself, but to actually come closer and to mm -hmm. channel different and conflicting mm -hmm. uh, feelings I, I have. And perversion is, again, when people move or wander, mm -hmm. like era, E-R-R-O-R, -R -R, mm -hmm. meaning wandering. Mm -hmm. I mean, era in this mm -hmm. sense is, mm -hmm. is good. I mean, it isn't good to have an era if I was getting the subway directions here and mm -hmm. you told me the wrong train. Or mm -hmm. I took, I often make mistakes like that and mm -hmm. I make an error going, in the, it, it, hard to do in this particular case because I started out at Times Square and I couldn't mm -hmm. go to New Jersey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Many times I, if I go north instead of south, I'm not uh -huh. saying that era is in every circumstance good, but in poetry, uh -huh. in particular, what poetry is an area for wandering, for perversity, exactly. for errant thought, and that kind of perversity, it's metaphoric mm -hmm. to say that. I'm not talking about mm -hmm. uh, doing things that are mean to other people mm -hmm. or, or, or cruel or, or in tweeting fact, your involving wiener. Involving that, right? I, what I am talking about is an imaginal space, and yeah. I think, by the way, you're just talking about particular ways that politicians are become uh, involved in kind of weird. I think part of that is that we don't have an imaginal space where people can, in that imaginal space, think unpleasant thoughts and mm -hmm. disturbing thoughts, write about them mm -hmm. and so on. Mm -hmm. And you can do that in writing, and that's mm -hmm. a great thing about the imaginal space, not just of poetry, but of theater and of, 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 of fiction and essays too, but poetry sort of in the forefront of imagining what you might not want to imagine. So in that sense, imagining the perverse. And again, uh, Byron is, of course, a great exemplary, huge popular culture figure, kind of a Madonna of his time. But Don Juan is about many perverse things, you know. Mm -hmm. That's and it's a comic piece. So he remains almost like a a person who's not like Wordsworth, a sincere romantic poet, but somebody who really says things that are just not acceptable to say, mm -hmm. <laughs> that are disturbing, that are. Are, are things that are there. So you don't want to make everything so repressed and squeaky clean and the sound and, 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 and even allowing senselessness to come through, even allowing things to be juxtaposed where you don't know why one thing follows another is an important part of poetic space to me and is a kind of perversity because one thing doesn't follow another in a logical way mm -hmm. but through a flights of, of, of fancy. I would add that it's uh, also topsy-turvy Yes, yeah, so, so we, 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 we have a uh, completely different viewpoint at uh, the things that we think we know. Mm -hmm. and, and then, uh, uh, like any art, but in poetry, it's, uh, I would um, paraphrase Ezra Pound, that it's time-space condensed in images. Mm -hmm. He said that uh, it's uh, like, um, just language condensed or, or in, in uh, 
words. So poetry is the most condensed form of, mm -hmm. of literature. Mm -hmm. More on that in just a moment. Now a word from our sponsors. part of this festival. I know it's a first annual festival, so I'm very um, excited about that. It's been a great, a wonderful opportunity, so many different films, different mm -hmm. topics, and I've just I've enjoyed it. I personally had harbored a desire or an ambition to do a film festival, but had not gone about doing anything for it because I knew it was a lot of work and I didn't have the time. So. Luckily for us, Dennis decided to do it. I'm very happy to be accepted here at Dennis's great festival. And you know, when you put a lot of work into something and you get acknowledged, it makes you feel good. You know, the draw, the draw of the contemporary media that was drawing the attention of, say, you know, people of away from poetry as something to be entertained and enlightened mm -hmm. by. You know, I, I wanted to. I want to say this. I want to get your response to this. You know, America may be considered, you know, by some as a cesspool, a, a very cesspool of media triteness. But isn't it also a wellspring of creativity, even for poetry? It, would you agree with that or not? In fact, or do you think that people are being say, they're they're being drawn into other forms of media and entertainment and away from this obviously valuable area of poetry? I would say that. Um in, in um, the United States is basically like sponsored by f foundations or um, professorships or something like that because it's very difficult to be an independent poet and uh, mm -hmm. um, basically no poets um, as now many in um, Europe as well mm -hmm. uh, cannot survive by, by uh, literary work uh, itself. Um, so there's more of a chance actually for a poet to survive here than there? Um, Did I get well, that wrong? Well, if you're getting known, if you're not really well known, uh, you have to do something else, as, as many poets uh, did in the beginning of their career. Then they, many of them finally ended uh, in the universities. Mm -hmm. So Which is not uh, such a bad place to be, uh, is it? No, it's not, but, but uh, not every poet uh, uh, is ending up um, uh, as my friend Charles Bernstein, for instance. Well, uh, yeah, I'm unusual in that I'm a, I'm a, prof you know, I'm a professor, although I started that work uh, when I was 40. Yeah, poetry is not a, a good career choice. It's a, it's a bad career choice. There's not really any way to make money from writing poetry. So it's something mm -hmm. that people do for reasons other than making a living by and large, and then mm -hmm. they do ancillary things. There's a kind of a response to what you're saying mm -hmm. in that essay I mentioned before, Please. and it comes in so perfectly. It's against National Poetry Month as such. So uh, here is my uh, s satiric conception that instead of promoting poetry, because this is what you're saying, shouldn't pe people be reading poetry No, not exactly. I'm not saying that we should promote it like, oh, it's good for well, you. You're, Eat your you're, vitamins. You're, no. you're seriously saying that in America, all this other media and so on, and poetry get its fair market But there's share, some great poetry so here as well. Of, of I mean, course. this culture is like, I mean, it's the muddy swamp in which the great lotus flower blooms. I mean, there's a lot of great creativity that uh, comes out of all this mess. To me, there's a, there's a problem in, in, in suggesting that poetry is somehow superior in any particular way mm -hmm. to other mm -hmm. media. Mm -hmm. It's not that I don't spend most of my life in promoting poetry and professing poetry and reading mm -hmm. it, but um, mm -hmm. I don't think, nonetheless, that poetry in and of itself mm -hmm. is preferable to other things that, that people do. In fact, that's one of the beauties of poetry, mm -hmm. is that it isn't preferable, mm -hmm. it isn't necessary. Mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. this is my response, that instead of National Poetry Month, we would have mm -hmm. National um, Anti-Poetry Month. Mm -hmm. As an alternative to National Poetry Month, I propose that we have an International Anti-Poetry Month. As part of the activities, all verse in public places will be covered over, from the Statue of Liberty to the freezes <laughs> on many of our government buildings. Poetry readers will be removed from radio and TV, just as they are the other 11 months of the year. Parents will be asked not to read Mother Goose and other rhymes to their children, but only fiction. 
religious institutions will have to forego reading verse passages from the liturgy and only prose translations of the Bible will be recited with hymns strictly banned. Ministers in the black churches will be kindly requested to stop preaching. Cats will be closed for the month by order of the Anti-Poetry Commission. Poetry readings will be replaced by self-help lectures. Love letters will have to be written only in expository paragraphs. Baseball will have to start its spring training in May. No vocal music will be played on the radio or TV or sung in concert halls. Children will have to stop playing all slapping and counting and singing games and stick to board games and football. As part of the campaign, the major daily newspapers will run, fun, will run full page ads with this text. Go ahead. Don't read any poetry. You won't be able to understand it anyway. The best stuff is all over your head, and there aren't even any commercials to liven up the action. Anyway, you'll end up with a headache trying to figure out what the poem is saying because they are saying nothing. Who needs that? Better go to the movies. We're about to uh, wind down in this discussion, and I want to ask you this question. Since the title of the show is Breaking Through, where is poetry going from here? Where is poetry's breakthrough? If you can even apply the concept to the topic of poetry. I would say poetry is always breaking through, because uh, poetry is uh, pushing, as, as I mentioned before, the language to its limit and even overcoming this. Mm -hmm. uh, so poetry, um, creates, uh, as Klevnikov said, you are sowing new eyes and you create new vision. Mm -hmm. That's breaking through. It's, it's every day. That's why we, 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 we have this meaning um, extracted. Okay, of course, uh, uh, the uh, essay that um, and Charles just wrote his um, an excellent uh, satire uh, as, uh, as an answer to uh, your previous question about uh, poetry in America. Uh, and that, that's uh, a reply. But the essence of it, yes, uh, poetry is doing this work uh, un, um, noticed by many. In, in the language itself mm -hmm. is breaking through. Yes. And then I it's a new agree. vision which is not um, expressed in the way of um, knowledge or the way of um, as essays do. Mm -hmm. It's uh, in, in images. Got it. You will understand that maybe um, 10 days or a month away from from it from now that you're you're listening to poetry yes charles any final words well i thought i would read two short poems one extremely short and the other pretty short uh to follow up on the, what we've been talking about the, this one is called johnny cake hollow and it's from all the whiskey in heaven my selected poems so quolen swacked und miri fluped sardone to flagrant swarm or germy plate or garvey swape it given durs irk flurp, sheb booty blur to daisy duel done fruity giggles gly, jud crylo pain jed jimsy's cack, enst erdoble flump glyer, eb hure blute, ig ore sweep, neb nist, neb ab, neb guan, schleb atsum imba outsi burft, alapi merp av ords, Ein Ainsley swish, ein Ainsley skloop, u gals dep dolster flug, ik ars un nimbit trul be group, ik ubers quake ag blurg. And my final poem goes like this. This poem intentionally left blank. Great contrast. And this is, of course, all the Whiskey in Heaven selected poems of Charles Bernstein. You have been watching the poetry installment of Breaking Through. We invite your comments to btelevision at gmail.com and we encourage you to buy Attack of the Difficult Poems and All the Whiskey in Heaven 
and elevate our consciousness in the realm of poetry. For my guests, Charles Bernstein and Ian Probstein, and for myself, W.J. O'Reilly, be well and see you next time. Thank you uh, for being here for the first inaugural episode of a brand new show called Still Standing with Ray Wagner. Drew a pentagram on the ground. I was like, oh, great Satan, take me. I will give you my soul if you stop this music. I'm Darren Fogg, and I'm going to be the host for the show tonight and every night as we strive this journey through time and space. First of all, you should buy a box because I tell you to. You ask, what is breaking through? It's a state of mind. Good evening, and welcome to the Kind of Late Show. Okay, Jack, that's fabulous. I'm going to get you um, to draw things for us. Let me get my marker. Welcome to the very first episode of Along With Claire. The first episode of Absolutely. Is this the hospital? And if that means you're meeting them sometime, then you have to get them. Matthew Steele! Capitalist pigs you don't understand. This is going to be an incredible, incredible episode. Flying cars, there's still people who haven't figured out the escalator. Yo, G Money, use your word. You know? Absolutely. <laughs> You're going to work, George. Ah, sorry for us. actors hired to play a reality family? I was on one of the first reality shows for people over 70. Mm. It was called oh. Last to Die. <laughs> <laughs> what happens when a middle-aged divorcee, <laughs> an aging child star, oh. and a trampy Greek girl all live in the same apartment, pursuing the same dream to be an actress? Find out on today's episode of I Hate Actors. <laughs> And a real stickler for the rules and a free spirit are both charged with managing the same theme restaurant. Find out in tonight's episode of Doc and Marty's Family Restaurant. Good evening and welcome everyone to the first ever taping of The Fog of Time. We're coming to you live from Long Island City, right underneath the 7 train. We're going to be bringing you guests from throughout time and bring them here in the studio and let them answer questions in their own words. I ended up in jail for it, as right. you often do, uh, when you're trying to completely take over a country. I don't drink or eat blood. Okay, well. I bathe and 
blood. You bathe in blood. I okay. bathe in blood. You bring him in, I kill him now. I'll tell you this. I am a free spirit, as they call it, you know. Because you capitalist pigs, you don't understand. But I hope from watching this show, you got to see a little bit of what was underneath that. And I hope you tune in next time as we delve into more characters like that. Have a good night. going to be an incredible, incredible episode. Yes! I say that for you to say, what is your dream? And when are you going to start taking action on it? You can do the same thing. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you all so, so much for coming today. I'm so honored to be there. This is so exciting. My first show. Thank you for tuning in. And I hope to see you next time. I absolutely. Thank you so much. Hi, this is Megan Boyle, and I'm here in the eGarage studio, and I'm about to talk with one of our own talk show personalities, W.J. O'Reilly, and he's going to tell us a little bit of information about his show, Breaking Through. All right, so really what I want to do now is just talk to you kind of about who you are, where, what got you to where you're at today, mm -hmm. and how that has enlightened you and inspired you mm -hmm. to come out with your show, Breaking Through. Uh, for me, my life has been about a combination of education and the media, and I really feel that this program has the potential of being kind of the perfect melding of those two uh, ideas, those messages. You know, there's so many downward trending kinds of things and the kind of the frivolity, the frivolousness of, you know, the the next, you know, Britney Spears train wreck or Charlie Sheen or whatever they're up to. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we live in a world where we're being bombarded with these kinds of messages and still maintain some kind of a balanced outlook, a balanced view? But there's something about finding a more enlightened and balanced way to deal with, you know, the tragedies in Japan, you know, or mm -hmm. the, 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 the latest uh, example of terrorism in, in Tel Aviv that happened just today. You know, how do we hold these kinds of things in such a way that they don't drag us down, but even maybe even tend to uplift us, uplift us yes. in some way? All right, awesome. Well, thank you so much for meeting you, with Megan. me. It was nice talking with you, right. W.J. O'Reilly. <laughs> All right, so be sure to check out W.J. O'Reilly's show, Breaking Through, airing Friday nights at 8 o'clock at www.egarage.tv. Hello, and welcome to the first installment of Breaking Through, a show about people, events, and ideas that pull us forward into a balanced and hopefully a better world. I'm your host, W.J. O'Reilly. Breaking Through aspires to taking us closer to discovering ways of transforming ourselves and the world without harming others or the planet. We leave you, we ask, what will you do to break through? For myself, W.J. O'Reilly, see you next time. this festival. I know it's the first annual festival, so I'm very um, excited about that. It's been a great, a wonderful opportunity, so many different films, different mm -hmm. topics, and I've just I've enjoyed it. I personally have harbored a desire or an ambition to do a film festival, but have not gone about doing anything for it because I knew it was a lot of work and I didn't have the time. So. Luckily for us, Dennis decided to do it. I'm very happy to be accepted here at Dennis's great festival. And you know, when you put a lot of work into something and you get acknowledged, it makes you feel good. Mm -hmm.